Okay, so let's chit chat about the lab. So, chit chat. Let's chit chat. So, you should look at what's going to become a factor and what's not going to become a factor. So, when you had that small pulley versus a large pulley, okay? So, here's, and this is going to play out large later on, and I promise you I'm going to ask you something about this on the test tomorrow, okay? So, here's the deal. When you... Let's say, for example, you had that small pulley and you had hooked up that 20 gram mass. Okay? Here's the deal. Why, and this is the fundamental thing, when you let go of that, why didn't it accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared? Because there's tension acting up with it. Which way? Up. Up, right? So here's the deal. So you've got gravity pulling down. And you have some amount of tension acting upward. Cool this. Okay? Now, here's the basic idea. Is that the, the difference between those two is going to create your net force. Now, which one's bigger? Gravity. Gravity. Because that's the direction that it falls. Oh, okay, right? So we went through this whole thing, and we came up with that tension is going to equal m times g minus a. Okay? Understand where that comes from. Okay? So, and again, this should be able to work under any circumstance. If you had... What was that? It's smooth. Right here. It's smooth. She's rubbing on his face. So, yeah, here's the deal. If you had just cut the string, okay? If you had just cut the string, and measure the acceleration of the system, what would that at value of A be? 9.8. You take 9.8 minus 9.8, you would get zero, zero tension. Yep. Right? True? Yeah. So, here's the deal. So, let's say, though, you have, you just hold it, and there's no acceleration. There is none. A is zero. Then what's the tension in the string? Not quite. Or whatever the weight is. It's yeah. Right? So if there's no acceleration, the tension in the string is equal to the weight. If it's in free fall, there is no tension. Okay? So here's what I want you to see. You're going to take 9.8 meters per second squared minus something. Okay? So look at this trend. As the acceleration, that measured acceleration... Okay, is that measured acceleration is the difference. Is okay, just think this through. If your if that acceleration is zero, that's when you have maximum tension. If the acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared, you have no tension. Okay? So as that acceleration, right, becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, as this acceleration here. Because bigger, you're, you're, you're going to subtract a bigger and bigger number. What's going to happen to the tension? Will it become bigger or smaller? If, as A gets big, if A gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Ten, tension is bigger. Right? Hold on. Tension is smaller. Why? Because that's the acceleration downwards. So the bigger it gets, um, the less acceleration, up, I mean, force upward there is. Yeah. So think this through. As, as you get a bigger, bigger, bigger acceleration, that's an indication that there's less and less and less of an upward force working against it. Okay? Because if there is no upward force acting against it, your acceleration is just going to be 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay? So think this through. Okay, right. Here's what's going to happen with tension. And hopefully that makes sense. Oh, yeah, right. As there's, if there's less stuff working against it, your net force is going to get bigger and your acceleration is going to get bigger. Now, here's the whole kicker. So that second calculation, where you're going to calculate torque, or if you're French, it's torque. A. Okay? This is where you're going to calculate torque. So remember, torque is vital that you remember this. Torque equals two things. It equals force times radius and it equals I, fish. I alpha. Okay? Right fish. 
equals two things. What we're after ultimately is the moment of inertia. Remember, you cannot directly measure moment of inertia. We don't have a measure a moment of inertia tool. Okay, we have a mathematical model that works beautifully, but there's no way to directly measure moment of inertia. Okay, so what we're going to do is going to calculate that torque. So to calculate that torque, we're going to take that tension on that string. Multiply that by the radius, because that tension is what's creating the force to make that spin. Because right now, why isn't this pulley spinning? Because there's no, no force. tension. Yeah, there's no tension. Now, if I give this a pull, what's going to happen? It's spin. Then it's going to accelerate, because then there's going to be some tension in the string. And the harder I pull it, guess what? The more tension. The more, the more tension that there is, the more... Torque. torque I generate, the greater the size of the fish. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Big fish. Big fish. Big pole, big fish. Small pole, small fish. No pole, no fish. No fish. No fish. No fish. No beans. Got it? Go fish, so to speak. Yes, so play that as kids, go fish. Yeah. Who didn't play that? I don't know. I didn't know if that. I didn't know if that hit golf. Well, like a I'm pretty sure that's a universal. Yeah, it's a, no, it's a universal know. game of parents oh, hated it's it. It's a universal experience. Okay. Never. So, you're going to calculate that tension. Okay. Should not be, or that that torque should be a pretty small number. Okay. A small. Which one? Is this the For the torque. Okay. Like times ten to the negative third. That's what I got. Okay. Yeah, my, my, my torques were 10 to the negative thing. Okay. Did you get them? Now, now you're going to calculate alpha. So here's the, here's the beauty of calculating alpha. We need to do that. Is that to look at this, it's really, it would be really tough to measure an angular acceleration because you'd have to know the initial rate of spin, which is obviously zero. But then how do you get that final rate of spin? Okay. Because when something's spinning, it isn't like we can shoot a radar gun at it and go, oh, it's spinning at so many radians per second. So what we do is we get clever. We said, oh, okay, right. We know that A equals our fish. So if we know the linear acceleration and we know the radius, we can calculate the fish. We can calculate the fish. Okay? So you took A over R and divided by fish. Now, that's going to change a lot. So like on that, what, when I did, when I took my data and I had that small data, that small pulley with the 20 gram mass, my alpha was about 40 radians per second squared. Um, but it's going to vary a lot. Okay. Like how much? I don't know. But like I got 40 and then I got 73 on the next one when I had the 50 gram. I got 14. Okay. Welcome to science. Okay, it isn't like you got four thousand. Yeah. Okay. Um, now here's uh, the ultimate kicker. <laughs> the ultimate kicker is that you're trying to measure moment of inertia. So we can't directly measure the moment of inertia. But what we can do is that we can measure the torque, and we can measure alpha. And then we can solve for that. So hopefully what you see, theoretically, is that your moments of inertia are typically around the high 10 to the negative fifths, like around maybe 8 times 10 to the negative fifth, to the low 10 to the negative fourths. Okay? That's typically about where they fall on this lab. Okay? So theoretically... If all these are identical, all of your moments of inertia would be exactly the same because they're all the same spinning object. They all have the same mass. They all have the same radius. But here's the problem. When you're calculating moments of inertia that are so small, if you're off by a little, then it manifests itself and carries through into something that looks horrible at the end. Okay? Pop. So those two moments of inertia should be... All four of them should be the, oh, all four, four of them should be the same. Oh, okay. In, in an it, ideal world, all of those moments of inertia would be the same. Okay. Why is yes, it, it's the same spinning disc every time. 
I thought, but the larger one, it's a larger radius. Oh, but it's a larger mass. Yeah. Well, no, no, it isn't. Really, it's, it's because you're, you're taking this, you're using different weights on the outside, but it's still the same. That moment of inertia is an intrinsic property of that pulley. How, how oh, okay. hard I pull doesn't matter. That's not going to affect the moment of inertia of that pulley. Yeah. So that's why I said they should, you should, in theory, if in an ideal world, Every one of those moments of inertia would be the exact same. But doesn't the radius affect that too? But, but, but we take that into account when we calculate that torque. Oh, okay. That, that's where that's balanced out. And then we also take it into account when we calculate the alpha because we're dividing it by that radius. Okay. Okay. So we compensate for that in the calculations. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, so on your experimental errors, don't flip out if you have a big experimental error, okay? Now, I want to make sure everybody has the same theoretical value. Your theoretical value on that page 3 should be 7.66 times 10 to the negative fifth, okay? Every, that should be the same for everybody because you're just going to use that information that I gave you, okay? So that's going to be 7.66 times 10 to the negative fifth. For which one? the theoretical value on the kind of towards the bottom of page three. Okay, that's going to be the same. So everybody's experimental error is going to be different. Okay, so show me those calculations. Now, let me kind of get you through these questions on the back. So if you had used the 20 and the 50 growth larger diameter pulley, what would have happened to the following? Okay. Think this through, okay? Think this through. Obviously, what's going to happen to your average acceleration when you put more weights out there on the end? Why? Increase. That's Why did you not tell me the right distance, dude? Why would it be point two five? Because we literally do. We both have. Okay. So this is what you want to think through and how this cascades. So you put a bigger weight out there you're going to get a bigger acceleration, right? Yep. That's what's going to happen, right? Now, then what's going to happen to the torque? Yeah, because think about it. If I want to make this thing, the faster I want to make that thing accelerate, the more torque I'm going to generate. Okay, torque's going to go up. So if my torque goes up, what's going to happen to my angular acceleration? It's going to go up. Now, but what's going to happen to the moment of inertia of the object? It's, the same. it's just going to stay the same because it's still the same disk. Okay? Yes, sir. Cool with that. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, when you get to question number nine, okay? When you get to question number nine, now there's going to be friction. Okay? Now there's going to be friction. Not enough to hold it in place, but there's going to be some friction. So this is what I this is another situation where you have to think this through. Okay, start with this idea. So instead of spinning freely, there's a little bit of friction. So when you let go of it, what's going to happen to the acceleration of that falling mass? It's going to become smaller. Okay? So, start with that idea. Oh, I'm going to have a smaller acceleration. Okay. Then think that through in terms of what's going to happen to the next thing. What's going to happen to your calculated tension? What's going to happen to the value of that torque? Hold on. Then what's going to happen to your angular acceleration? Okay. Then ultimately, notice on that last one, I want you to realize what's going to happen to your calculated moment of inertia. In other words, not the actual moment of inertia, okay, but what you would get as a calculated value based upon that. Now, just think this through. Moment of inertia is a resistance to a change in angular velocity, right? So if you have a bigger moment of inertia and then you and 
if that goes up, what's going to happen to your acceleration? Assuming that you have the same torque applied to it. Yeah, it's going to make it harder to spin. So having friction on that system is a similar concept to saying, oh, I got a bigger moment of inertia. Because it's, it's no matter what, you're increasing that resistance to a change in that angular velocity. Okay? Got that. Okay. Now, I knew it was only two. On number 10, let me give you the, the answer to number 10. Because if 10A is wrong, everything else is just going to be a train wreck. Okay? So to 10, that answer to 10A should be about 16 radians per second squared. Because if you start off wrong with that, everything else is going to be a train wreck. And so when you get all the way down to the end, when you get all the way down to the end to G, and you calculate that angular momentum at the end of 4.75 seconds, that angular momentum on G should, this is an ish, but it should be around 70. Okay? So when you get all the way down to the end on number 10, that's going to be around 70. Now, let's talk about this last question. I promise you, and we're going to work through this. We're going to spend some time going through this because there's a lot of this on here. Okay? I promise you there is going to be something like this last question on the test where I'm going to expect you to derive some equations for spinning objects. We're going to go through this whole thing. Or I'm going to at least get you a pretty solid start on it. On the test, it won't be this complicated. I'm not going to expect you to take it all the way through, but I'm going to expect you to know the concept. So let me set this up so you get an idea of what's happening. Subtracted by um, force cutter. What? That's what I did. What the heck? Force cutter is subtracted by force cutter. You okay with it? Okay, so step away from the calculations, focus. Trust me on this one, focus. So here's your setup. You've got two different strings attached. So out here, and this is what I've got set up like a similar to this. Wait, where is this question? It's the very last the question back. on the back page. Oh, it's on the back? Yeah. Oh. So I've got the smaller weight out here, and I've got the bigger weight in here. So when I let go of this, notice that it begins to accelerate, right? So here's what you want to look at. If I just cut this string, what would happen? That one would fall. That one would fall, right? Yep. So this is creating a torque that wants to make this pulley spin in this direction. True? Okay. Now, if I cut this one, what would happen? The other one would fall. The other one would fall, right? So do you see that I have two different torques involved? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One torque is making it spin in this direction. The other one, the other torque is trying to make it spin in the opposite direction. So just like you could have a net force, guess what? You could also have a net, net torque. What is that dinging sound? Oh, Probably <sighs> fine. So we need to find the net torque. Okay. 
which is going to be the difference in two torques. Got that idea? Okay. Now, are we good? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Now, got the idea. We're going to have the difference between two torques. Which one? Which torque is bigger? The one with the bigger mass or the one with the smaller mass? Bigger, 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 mass. bigger mass. So the torque on the big mass is, is minus the torque on the smaller mass. Okay? Big mass is going to be bigger. That bigger mass, bigger torque. Okay? Now, so here's what you want to look at. That difference in torque, remember, also equals two things. It also equals I alpha. True? Yeah. Now, so if you look at, this is a, actually a multiple choice, okay? But look at how every one of these are played out. Notice that every one of them is solved for an angular acceleration. So at some point, we want to get alpha by itself, okay? So this, you got to figure out how the game is played. So here's the deal. Let's focus first on this bigger mass, okay? So when I let go of it, it begins to fall downward, right? So in terms of the bigger mass, which is bigger? The downward pull of gravity or the upward force of tension? Downward pull of gravity. So on this one, Fg is bigger than my tension. True? Go with this. Now, on the smaller one on the outside, which one's bigger? Tension. 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 How do you know? Because it goes up. That's the direction that it accelerates. So over here, my tension is bigger than my force of gravity. Force of gravity. Cool with that. Good. So what we ultimately want to do is solve these for tension. Now, I'm going to take these apart so I can write. But you got the idea about what's going on? Sir. Sure. Okay. All right. So. All right. So here's what you want to look at. This is going to take me some space. So we're going to focus on the big mass first. Okay. So on the big mass, and you have to look at it in terms of how this thing is, is being defined. So that bigger mass is going to be, that Fg is going to be M1 times G, right? Because that's how they're defining it. That bigger mass is going to be called M1. You have to, you, you, in a problem like this, you have to work it within the parameters of how the problem is going to play out. So it's got M1, and that radius is just defined as R. I don't know what the radius is. I don't care what the radius is. I just know that it's going to be R. That's it. It's the only thing I know. So here's the deal. So we're going to look at the net force, right? Now, which one is bigger for the big mass? Force gravity, gravity or the tension? Gravity. 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 So that's going to equal M1A, because any net force is mass times acceleration. Hip with that. Okay, so that's going to equal M1G minus tension. Makes sense. Because I've got gravity pulling down, and that's bigger than the tension that's working in the opposite direction. So the difference between those two is going to be my net force. So what I want to do is I want to get tension by itself. So Beckham. How can I get tension by itself? And I want a positive T. Uh, I'm going to call that T1. I want to get T1 by itself. No, 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 no. I'm going to get T by itself, and I want T to be positive. Algebra. Algebra. First of all, good answer, Louis. What, can I give you a hint on where to start? Yeah. I'd add T1 to both sides. Oh, okay, yeah. So I got T1 plus M1A equals M1G. Now what are you going to do? 
I want to get T by, I want to get tension by itself. So try to So my ten is going to be M one G minus M one A, right? So then what could I do if I want to get fancy? Oh, I could write that as M one times G minus A, right? Now, look at your choices. It's a multiple choice. Look at your choices. Do any of those choices have A in them? Yes. No. 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 What do they all have? Alpha. Alpha. Oh, okay. Yeah. So instead of A, what do you think we can put? Alpha. alpha. Just alpha? Alpha. A one. equals radius. R alpha. A doesn't equal alpha. A equals R alpha, right? But which R do I use, R1 or R2? R1. R1. So I can rewrite this as, depending on what you want to do, M1G minus M1 R alpha. R alpha. Or if you wanted to get fancy, you could, calc you could factor out that M1 if you wanted to, okay? So here's the point. That's how I'm going to express the tension. This is what I'm going to expect you to be able to do on the test tomorrow, is to get to this point, okay? Or it's going to be one of the last questions on the test, okay? It's going to be mambo points. Make sure that you can get to this point. Now, how am I going to calculate the torque? Here's my tension, right? How can I use my tension times to calculate the torque? Times the radius. Times the radius. So what I'm going to do is, and again, notice on your choices over there, you don't have tension. What do you have? You got M's, you got G's, you got alphas. You don't have tensions. So my torque is going to be on one is going to be tension one times the radius. Mm -hmm. But I don't want it in terms of tension one because that isn't those aren't my choices. What are my choices? Oh, they're all expressed in things like this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? So I can put in either one. But since this is multiple choice, I gotta look at how the game is played. Oh, the game is played with some very really funky variables, so I gotta go to the funky side of the variable, even though it would just be easier to say, oh, that's T1R. But I'm gonna substitute this in. So I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna write this as M1G minus M1R alpha times that radius. Okay? Cool with that. Yeah. That's just one of them. Okay, so that's 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 the torque that's trying to make it spin created by the middle. The middle one. Okay. Now what, do we, now what do you think we're going to have to do? The exact same thing, the oh, outside. Ah, the exact same thing, but on the outside. Now, so we're just going to, we're just kind of bank this for now. Okay, we'll get back to it. We're just going to bank that. Okay, we're just going to bank it. So, now we need to figure out what's going to happen on two. Now remember on two, that's where we had the smaller mass. So which one's bigger, the tension, tension. or the gravitational field? Tension. 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 So if I take tension minus M2G, right? Yeah. That's going to give me my net force. True, same idea. But here's what's different. On the first one, gravity was bigger than the tension. That's why it fell. Mm -hmm. On the second one, tension is bigger than the gravity. That's why it went up. Okay. Now, what if tension just equals your gravitational pull? It's it's no it's net force. It's not going to accelerate, right? Okay, so listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. As you're defining this, you have to look at which direction these forces are, these masses are moving. If it's moving up, tension is greater than gravity. If it's falling, gravity is bigger than the tension. Okay, you have to start, if you don't have that part right, everything else you're going to do is going to be a train wreck. Okay, it has to start that way. Okay, so one situation tension is bigger, the other situation gravity is bigger. If you start wrong, this whole problem turns into a train wreck. Okay, 
But that's one of the things that you've got to be able to do is look at this in terms of net force. Now, there's the deal. So that's going to equal M2 A, and I'm going to call this T2. Now, back at this one, we want to do the same thing. I want to get T2 by itself. So what am I going to do? Yeah. So tension 2 is going to equal M2A plus M2G. Cool with that. Got that one. No worries. Now, but I, can I have A? No, can't have A. A equals R alpha. Now, be very, very careful. What's the radius for that other for that other pole? Two R. Two R. You have to substitute in two R. Okay, two R, not two R. In this case, U two R. So this is going to be M two times two R fish. Two R fish plus M two G is going to equal T two, right? So the torque on two, okay, this is going to get a little bit complicated. So that's going to be M2R alpha plus M2G, because we're talking torque, so that's, that's the force part of it. That's just the force part of it. But then what do you have to multiply that by? 2R. Oh. Not R, 2R, because that's the radius, it's 2R. Cool with this. Okay, so here's what we have at this point. We have this calculation of torque. So this is the torque on the outside. This is the torque on the inside. Okay? We have two calculations of torque. Which one's bigger? The inside torque or the outside torque? Inside. Inside torque, why? Because it goes accelerates down. Yeah, the, the, the bigger mass falls. So that tells you the torque one is bigger than yeah, torque two. two. So what we're going to write this as, as my net torque is going to equal torque one minus torque two. Okay? Now this is going to be the substitution from all get out. So torque one, we said was R times M1G minus M1R alpha. So all I did was just substitute that in. We already found it. That's the hard part. Okay, we already found it. Good with this. Yeah. Now, I'm going to subtract this. Okay? So I'm going to subtract, I'm going to rewrite it just a little bit. 2R times M2R plus M2G. Now, torque also equals two things. What is torque also, at the, old, at the end of the day, what else does torque equal? I fish. I fish, right? Now, now we begin to play the game. Now we're ready to play the game. We have the rules of the game established. Look at your choices over there, okay? Do any of those look remotely close to this? No. No. First off, what are they all divided by? Where where have they all, where have they all put I? On the bottom. On the bottom. They all put I on the bottom. Why? To get to get yeah. fish by itself. Get out fish by itself. Fish by itself. Okay, you got to get fish by itself, so yeah. you lose your eye, so to speak. Dang. Okay. So you're gonna move I over to the other side. Divide it. Now, let me give you a hint. At this point, I'm gonna turn you loose. But I'm going to give you some hints. Okay. If you look at your choices, notice that all, what do they all have in common? What do factor what does out, every choice have in common? Factored out R and G. They factored out R and G. So what do you think you need to do with your with your? This is a pirate thing. What are you going to do with your R's? No, 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 no. You got to do before you can factor them. What do you have to do? Yeah, you got to distribute your R's. Then you could factor out your R's. So the first thing that I would do is I would distribute this R 
Now, you have to be very careful on this next step. You need to distribute the negative to R. Okay? Be careful. When, you, when I take this 2R times that 2R, what am I going to get? Negative 4R. Yeah, squared. 4R squared. Okay? So what you've got to do, at this point I'm going to turn you loose. Okay? I'm going to turn you loose. Let me give you a hint. Distribute this R. Distribute that negative 2R. Get everything spread out. Then rebuild it, okay? Then rebuild it to see what can you do to consolidate your terms to get something like your choices over there, okay? Let me give you a hint what it's not. It is not A, okay? It is not A. I'll tell you that. But notice that they all have I on the bottom, okay? So at that point, it just turns into the factoring and algebra problem from the depths of despair. So on the test tomorrow, okay, listen to me. On the test tomorrow, this is as far as I will expect you to be able to go. Okay? I'm not going to make you spend 10 minutes doing the algebra. Okay? The, the important concept that I'm going to expect you to understand, okay? and, th and this is the heart and soul of this whole thing, is that when you hook this up, and I'm going to tell you which one's going to fall. Okay? So in this situation, I've got that big mass here, and I've got... The smaller mass over here. Okay? What I've got. Okay? So I'm going to give you a setup just like this. It's going to be very similar to this. And I'm going to tell you which direction this thing is going to go. So I'm going to tell you either the big mass falls or the small mass falls. Now, what I can do. Let's say, for example, I put another 10-gram mass here. Now, an interesting thing happens. If I put a 10 gram, another 10-gram mass out here and let go of it, that one falls. So notice this. This is 100 grams. So over here, I could, this is a total of 40 grams, and that's 100 grams. So I can make a 40 gram mass lift a 100 gram mass by changing where that on the size of the pole. So this is how elevators work. Okay? So here's your elevator. This is going to be this big massive one. So what you can do is, if you hook this up right, you can have smaller masses that are moving out here to make the big elevator move. Now, obviously, you want to monitor the accelerations, right? You don't want to go, ahead, woo, okay, that's going to end well. So here's the point. Depending on how you want to set up the elevator, you can either have this be your counterweight and that be the elevator itself, or you could have this be the elevator and that be the counterweight. Now, realistically, you're an engineer. You're designing this system, Okay. Which one do you think probably needs to have move more? The big counterweight or the elevator? The elevator. The elevator. So in this situation, guess what? You want this to be the elevator. Because that's going to be moving from the 10th floor to the first floor. What then, this doesn't have to move as much. So, oh, I want to go from the 5th floor to the first floor. Whoop. Okay? So this here only had to move a small amount to make this move a lot, okay? Oh, let's go all the way down to the basement, Woo! okay? So I can make this move from here all the way up to here. But look at how far this thing only has to move. This thing only has to move from here 
up to there to make that smaller weight go that entire length. So that's the advantage of counterweights when you, when you design elevators. So I can have a small weight, excuse me, I can have a large weight move a small distance to create, to make that move a greater distance. So on the test, so here's my promise to you. As long as you understand that you get this idea, that you're gonna have two torques, Okay, torque on the big, torque on the small. Understand the role of tension, okay? So whichever one goes up, tension is bigger than the gravity. gravity. The one that goes down, gravity is bigger than the tension. tension. Be able to write that in terms of net force, okay? The only difference is that which one do you subtract? I'm gonna send this video out to you all, okay? Make sure that you get that concept, okay? I'm not going to make you do all the algebra, but I'm going to make, make sure that you understand this concept, okay? Cool with that. Yeah. All right, so there's going to be two primary parts to the test. There's going to be a linear mo momentum section, and there's going to be an angular momentum section, okay? Now, remember, what is force times time equal? Oh dear Lord. Momentum or change in momentum? Momentum. Change in momentum. Change in momentum. Okay? Because remember, that's your net force equals change in momentum, right? So what that means in a general idea, if you were to draw a force time graph, and let's say that you have a constant force applied over a certain amount of time. I have constant force, same net force. You hit the brakes for the same amount of, all the time. You hit the gas pedal and you keep it there. This is your net force, not your applied force, net force. What is the area underneath that graph going to represent then? Do not make this difficult. Change in momentum. Because it's Newton times time. Seconds, Newton seconds. So the area under any force time graph represents Newton seconds, Newton seconds which is going to be change of, momentum. change of momentum. Now, let's say I gave you a force time graph that looks something like this. What would that what would that physically mean as you're driving your car? What would that what is physically happening? Louis, you know cars. Yeah. What is physically happening for me to generate that graph? That's force time. It's a force time graph. And as a function of time, my force is increasing. Uh, you're accelerating. Well, no, you're... Yeah, you are accelerating. Getting I am accelerating, but don't, 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 throw, don't throw acceleration into this. You're braking? Like, the harder you brake... Changing the Close. Moment. Momentum. Momentum changing? Momentum is changing. But think about this. I'm starting with no force, right? Yeah. And the force is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So let's say that... Oh, uh, you're going around a tighter and tighter point. No, 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 no. There's nothing. No, no, no. Do momentum is increased. This. Do not throw corners into this. Okay? Ah, you hit a pole. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a linear graph. Louie, <laughs> what's the function of the gas pedal? To accelerate you. To change what? Velocity. Your velocity. In terms of this graph, what's the function of the gas pedal? The function of the gas pedal is to increase your force over time. Change the amount of force that you apply, right? Yeah. More important. So you're starting off and you're not applying any force. Your foot is not on the gas pedal. Yeah. So as time goes by, you're applying more and more and more force. Okay. So what are you doing to the gas pedal? Oh, I see. Okay, so when you have the gas pedal floored, the engine revs up and it gives you more force. Ah. Okay. So as a function of time, what am I doing to this gas pedal? I'm pushing it down harder and harder and harder because I'm creating more and more 
force. Okay? Now, let's say this levels off. When that levels off, then what's happening? Same amount of force. Yeah, I'm the same amount of force, right? Yeah. Okay? If this goes down, then what's happening? Yeah. Then I've then I'm decreasing, I'm letting off that gas, off the gas pedal, yeah. right? So it's possible, hint hint, to have a force time graph that's not linear. All that's happening is that you're changing the amount of force. Okay? So if you're applying the same force over the same period of time, it's a linear function, it's a horizontal line. If you are changing that amount of force, whether, and it was something Louis alluded to earlier, this could also have been the brake pedal. Okay? Maybe I'm pushing on the brake pedal harder and harder and harder, and then I'm letting off the, the brake pedal. Okay? But no matter what, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. No matter what the shape is on a force time graph, it's going to represent the change in momentum. Okay? Keep that point. Now, change in momentum also equals mass times change in velocity. Now, you also have to remember what's going to be available to you on the test. If you look at your yellow sheet, So here's the anomaly about this, okay? So if you look at this momentum thing, you only have two momentum equations. You have mass times velocity. That's a lot of help. That was a tough one. And then you have change in momentum equals force times time. Okay? That's it. Those are the only ones you have. Now, on the linear side, over here, you've got... And they, wrote, they write it kind of a funky way. So over here they have torque equals, or they have acceleration equals torque over I. So they don't even really play you straight up and say, oh, torque equals I alpha. They've solved this for alpha, and they wrote it as torque over I. Okay? So that's where that equation is. But then down here they tell you torque equals force times radius. So you got torque equals force times radius, and then alpha equals torque over I. So they could have made this much simpler and just said, oh, torque equals two things. It equals I alpha and it equals force times radius. But they wanted to be a jerk and write it separately and why I don't know, but they did. Okay? Now, the other thing they have is that L equals I omega. So what's L representing? Uh, and your momentum. I is your uh, moment of inertia. Omega is? Radians per second. Then they also gave you that delta L equals torque times delta T. So all this means is that if I've got this bicycle wheel and I want to change its angular momentum, what do I have to apply? A force. I got to apply a torque, right? And guess what? That torque has to act over a certain period of time, right? So guess what? No torque. No change, in no change in angular momentum. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, here's the deal. Look at this. If you were to draw a torque time graph, what do you think the area underneath the torque time graph would give you? Change in angular, change in angular momentum. Okay, that makes sense. So if I apply a little bit of torque for just a short amount of time, I don't change my angular momentum very much, okay? Very small area. But if I apply a big torque over a large amount of time, guess what? Now I've got a big change in my angular momentum. Same thing is true if I want to slow it down. If I just apply a tiny bit of force for just a short amount of time, I don't change that. But if I apply a big force over a longer period of time, I'm going to create a bigger change in them. Okay? You have, you deploy, you deploy a spaceship, a satellite. Okay? I did. Okay. And initially, it's spinning at a certain rate. Okay? And you want satellites to spin at a certain rate. It's actually called a barbecue roll. 
and later on you'll do problems with this. And literally, that's what it's called, it's the barbecue. Because it's like a rotisserie chicken. You don't want one side being exposed to direct sunlight all the time, because you have one side that would get really, really hot, and the other side would get really, really cold. So it's literally called a barbecue roll. So let's say that the satellite is spinning at a certain rate. So imagine I'm the satellite, okay? And I'm gonna spin at a certain rate. So I'm going around like this, okay? I'm spinning at a certain rate. Now, at some point, I'm going to deploy my solar panels, okay? So visualize this. So I am here. I had another program mass. Okay, there it is. All right, so imagine this. I'm spinning like this, I'm the satellite. I'm going to put my arms out. What's going to happen? You're going to rotate slower. Why am I going to rotate slower? Because you increase the radius. But did I change my value of L? No. Because L has to be conserved. So I do this, and then I put this out. But if I bring it back in, Okay? Yeah. All right. Now, let's talk about the direction of the angular momentum vector, okay? You all seem to be struggling with this concept. So, here is the green spinny thing, okay? <laughs> the green spinny thing is going around like this, okay? Does it have angular momentum? Yes. 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 It's spinning. Yes. It has mass. It has moment of inertia. Right. Yes. I so if this is if if it's in this plane, yep. and it's spinning like, <laughs> and it's spinning like this, you take your right hand and you wrap it in the direction that it's spinning. And your thumb is going to point down. Down. downward. So if this is spinning like this, my angular momentum vector is pointing down towards the ground. Now, if I spin it like this in the opposite direction, then I curl my hand like this, the momentum vector is going to point upward. Now, if I put it like this and spin it, okay? So I'm like this and spinning it. So it's going like this. My momentum vector is going to point to my left. left. But if I have it going like in the opposite direction, then I'm going to curl my hand like this, and then it's going to point to the right. right. Okay? Got that idea? Yes. How do you okay. know on paper? So what, are, like, what, are so what, what I would do... So it looks like some of them were meant to be like vertical. No, 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 no. I'm gonna tell you straight up. No, no, no. I'm, I'm. It's gonna, no, it's gonna be something no. like a wheel, mm -hmm. and you assume that that wheel is spinning in the plane of that paper. Oh, okay. That's crazy. Okay. Yeah. So it would be like this. I would say here's. It's like you're looking down on it. That's yeah. Here's the green spinning thing. No, but it just. Wants and this thing is spinning like this. So. You drop your hand like this, and the point, and it would point. I was just confused about the point. Now, if I wanted it, if I wanted it something different, then I'd have like the bicycle wheel, like the handles are like this, and then I would have it in this plane. Okay, then I would say, hey, it's coming. Then I would draw an arrow like this thing is rotating towards you. Okay. So then you say, okay, it's going like this. Then it would point to like the left or the right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got that. Yeah. Okay. Now, what are some things? Let's talk about this. What are some things that will affect the angular acceleration of this wheel if I apply a torque to it? What's What are some things that will affect the angular acceleration of this wheel? What do you mean? Uh, what do you mean? The torque. The torque. Okay. Uh, in the in the eye, the moment of inertia. Okay. What affects moment of inertia? Mass radius. and radius. Okay. So it's the mass of the wheel, but also radius of where that mass is located. So I could have that mass concentrated to the inside, or I could have that mass concentrated towards the outside. outside. 
Let's talk torque. What are the two things that affect torque? Force and radius. Force and radius. So I could apply a force right here by the center and get a certain acceleration. Yeah. Or I could apply that same force out here and get a big, big. So this is why when something is spinning, you cannot use F equals MA. Because if I apply that force here, that's a completely different acceleration if I apply it out there on the end. Okay? Keep that in mind. All right. Uh, I promise you, you're going to have, and I gave you that assignment back if you hand it in, and that was the one where you had like a spinning ball, and then a bug lands on it, and then you calculate the new rate of spin. So there's two ways that momentum is conserved. You could have linear where you'd have like, say, a bullet plus a block equals the new momentum of the bullet plus the new momentum of the block. Okay? That's if it's linear. If it's spinny, you would have like the L with the ball plus the L with the bug equals L prime of the ball plus L prime of the bug. If you have not done something like this on both problems, by the time you hand in the test, you have done something horribly wrong. Okay? Now, the ball and the bug is going to be a California problem, which means what? What can you factor out? Stick together. The ball, the bug. What are the two things that, what are the two things you multiply to calculate I? I, W. Excuse me, to calculate L. L, I, W, I, W. So that would be I of the Every time. ball times some omega plus I of the bug. Same omega. Oh, this bus. So what can you but factor prime. out? But but prime. Prime. So yeah. I of the ball plus I of the bug but times butt prime. prime. So what do you know about butt prime compared to the initial rate of spin of the ball? It's going to be smaller because you've increased the moment of inertia. Yes. If you get done with the test and you haven't done something like that, you have done something horribly wrong. Okay? Well, I'm just telling you, you've you kind of missed the whole point of it. Okay? Same thing is true with linear momentum. Remember that big problem where it worked where the ball hit the ground? Bounced up? Okay? Promise you that's going to be on there. Promise you. Promise you, promise you, promise you. Okay? Which one were you? Huh? Which one was that on? The way it bounced up. Was that on the? It was today we watched the videos of the car crash. It's the small slip of paper, right? Huh? The small yeah, that small slip of paper. How do you do? So. Or you have this one. There's one like that. There's one like it on the review. Oh, okay. Okay. We're getting. All right. Yeah. There's one like it on the review. So speaking of the review. Dude. Uh, I, I keep everything cancels out <laughs> on this uh, thing. No, it doesn't. Or depending on which one you want to do. Okay. To me it does. So, if push comes to shove, if you have no time for anything else, make sure you can work 14. Okay? Because this is one where a ball is dropped, it hits the ground, bounces up. The only thing I can do on this problem is change the numbers. That's it. I can change the height that it's, lift, that it's released from, I can change the height that it bounces to, I can change the time, I can change the mass. And this is going to play out exactly with this. Down is going to be defined as negative, up is going to be defined as positive. You're going to find the change in momentum of the ball, you're going to find the change in momentum, or once you get that, you're going to have the time, you're going to calculate the force. One of the things I'm going to tell you this right now, this is going to be a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step problem. Okay, and I'm going to make sure that you have paid attention to the sign of the displacement, the sign of the velocities, the signs of your accelerations. Okay, so this is completely worked out on here. Okay, so here's number 14, completely worked out how I want it worked out. Okay, so you have the perfect example of how this is done. Think through it. So again, here's what I would do. I would treat this as the test. 
I would take this test, I would take that yellow sheet, or I would take this, I would take that yellow sheet, and I would try and work every problem on here. When you get done, then I'd go back and look at how I did it. Okay? So, whatever you do, it's an old joke, but I know kids do it. Don't look at number one, set step with mine, and go, oh, yeah, yeah, work camp's good. Yeah, I would work that the exact same way. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Okay? <laughs> You all laugh, but I know some of you do it, okay? <laughs> don't, okay? You? Hide this. You too, you don't, don't even do. breathe on it, okay? Seriously, don't even breathe on it. So, you can hand in the lab tomorrow if you want to hold on to it. That's cool, because there's going to be one like that last question, okay? There's going to be one like that last question on the test. You mark my words. I'm not going to make you do all the algebra, but I'm going to expect you to be able to get to where you can calculate the torque and the difference between the tensions. Okay? All right. Detour. Detour.